Hey Tom, we're here at Warriors Path State Park and I want to know the basics to golf. And you are the master and I am the student. So what can you tell me a little bit about golf? What are some of the basics here? You know, golf is like anything else. It's made up of a basic set of fundamentals hmm. to strike the ball, keep it moving forward in the right direction, hopefully, and we'll put it into the hole. From here to there, From all here the way over there. there. Okay. That here to there may vary. That from may hole take to hole. me a while. <laughs> this and, is a and, and, this, that's a pretty long distance there, Tom. <laughs> distance and direction has a lot to do with it. So Okay, uh, I will try my best. <laughs> we'll we'll learn that as we get up here approaching the ball. So. Alright, sounds good. Let's do it. First thing you have to do is just it's relax. Remember it's about balance and rhythm. Okay. You want to be comfortable over the ball. You always have to keep your eye on the ball. Alright, so and don't close my eyes. That's right. And then you'll start your swing, you'll basically rotate, oh and you'll swing through the ball. The okay. most important thing is you must keep your head down okay. and watch the ball. Left arm straight. Yeah, your right arm will be next to your body. Does it go right here, like this? No, nope, the other way. There you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a game about balance and rhythm. Now try striking it. Okay. Keep your head down. I'm going to try striking it. Don't, don't swing too far back, just the basics. Okay. Yep. Like so. And there you go. Okay. Whoa. There we go. <laughs> First uh, one goes well. That's okay. We want a challenge here. So uh, <laughs> you want you to rotate your body slightly as well as your shoulders. So like this? Yep. Uh, Woo! I got a little well spin done. on that one. That well was pretty done. good. So if it's going right, does that mean my I need to hit it more in the center of the club? Uh, that means you're doing something wrong when you strike the ball. <laughs> you're, you're, that means I'm doing something But that's okay. First things first. <laughs> you got to learn to strike the ball. First thing is to hit the ball. To execute all the mechanics together. All right, here we go. Good. That was a good one. Excellent. Woo, look at that. You're close to what you should hit that if you were proficient. That was much better, wasn't it? John, I do believe you're teachable. So you're saying I'm proficient? I'm saying you're being more consistent, <laughs> and I believe you're coachable. Okay, that sounds good. Excellent. That sounded good. Hey, I actually have no idea where the well ball done. is, though. <laughs> now we're going to start the final part of the game, which is putting. Okay. Keep your head still over the ball. Never take your eyes off the ball. Strike the ball, and then you can look up. A little harder. That ball was in the hole if you struck it harder. Oh, perfect putt. This game, like we discussed, is about balance, rhythm, touch. I can see how a bad putt game can really put you behind. Oh! Oh, I was close! Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Woo! I did it! <laughs> oh my goodness! You've completed one hole. Now we only have 17 more to go. You're on your way to better learning. So. Not professional just yet? Well, as long as you stick with the fundamentals. Okay, okay. Then I'll be Tiger Woods level is what you're telling me. Uh, you'll be progressive. Okay. We'll sounds... leave it at that. <laughs>
121. That's what his buddies called him. So old three iron and 121. Um, the two of us not going to teach you a whole lot about uh, golf. Golf is one of those things, man. It's one of those sports that like the fundamentals, the most basic things about it seem really, really hard, right? Like let's take a tiny little ball, right? And let's get an only slightly less tiny little blade And then let's try to hit it into a slightly less tiny little hole. And let's put the hole 500 yards away. Let's see how they do with that. It's just a complicated sport. I know it has fundamentals. I know Tom was teaching John some of the fundamentals. But man, they're the fundamentals of what I think is maybe the most complicated sport ever. We're talking fundamentals here at First Christian over the last few weeks. We're talking about fundamentals of faith. Uh, What are some basic things that just kind of hold this faith together? Ethan got us off to a wonderful start for the past couple of weeks. He talked about creation. He talked about kingdom of God, wonderful messages you need to go back and listen to if you haven't heard them. Uh, For those of you who don't know me, my name is John. I'm one of the ministers here, and I'm going to try to keep us rolling uh, throughout uh, this series today. Uh, But since, obviously, I can't teach you uh, an illustration uh, from the game of golf, I want to do an illustration from a game that I do know. So give me a ball, Joel. Yes, well done. I want to teach you a little bit from the game of football. And I know lots of you understand this game. So I want to ask you a question about one of kind of the most basic fundamental understandings of the game of football, okay? It is said that the game of football has three main phases, okay? And I want you all to see if you can guess the third. They say the main phases, the three phases of football are offense, defense, and Special teams, yes, some of you knew that. Well done. Offense, defense, and special teams. And and here's the thing. Um, Those things are crucial because they are fundamental. Without recognizing that, a team is going to be compromised on the field of play, right? Score all the points that you want. But if you don't have a defense that can keep people from scoring, your ability to win is going to be compromised. Or if you have a great defense, right, and you can keep people from scoring very many points, but if you have no offense, well, then your ability to win is going to be compromised, right? Or, uh, you know, special teams, man. Special teams, they have an outsized impact on the game because an offense will work seven, eight, A lot of times, more than 10 plays to get some points. But in special teams, it takes one play. You know, they they block a a punt and run it back for a touchdown. Or or you give up a kick return after after you score. You give give up a kick return for a touchdown. In a blink of an eye, it can change the game. If they don't recognize these three kind of fundamental aspects of football, it will greatly compromise a team's ability on the field. I want you to understand that. To help you get a grip on what I want to talk to you about today. That's all I'm doing with football, Joel. You can come back out. Can you catch it? Don't come back out. No. Joel is a big man. I do not want to tackle him. Uh, no, here's, here's the thing. This is the reason I want you to recognize that kind of aspect of, of, of football. When it comes to our faith, we can be compromised as we try to live it out as well if we don't recognize and understand certain fundamental things, specifically fundamental beliefs about Jesus. That's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to offer to you three fundamental things about Jesus that we have to understand if we hope to follow him, because as you guys can probably guess, it's pretty hard to follow what you don't understand. And we're a room of people, you're here today, I'm assuming because you're interested at least and the idea of following Jesus. And I want you to be able to do that. But we have to understand at least these three things about who Jesus is. I, I want you to have them memorized before we go. And so I'm going to go ahead and give them to you right here at the beginning. Uh, what I want you to know before you leave today is that I need to know Jesus as maker, savior, and ruler. I need to know Jesus as maker, savior, ruler. Say that with me. I need to know Jesus as maker, savior, ruler. Let's talk about Jesus as 
maker. I want to play a little game, a little Bible trivia with you. I'm going to put a verse on the screen. There's going to be a blank, and I want you guys, when I count to three, I want you guys to fill in the blank for me. Now, don't worry if you don't really know many Bible verses at all. I think these two things, you, you might be able to get them from the context, okay? So let's put the first one up on the screen. The first question or verse that I want you to fill in the blank. In the blank, God created the heavens and the earth. Fill that in for me in one, two, three. Beginning. Well done. Lots of people got that one. Bonus point. What book of the Bible is that from? Very good. Appropriately enough because the word Genesis means beginnings. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. File that away for me. Another one. Let's put the other one on. Second, number two, up on the screen. And God blank. Let there be light. Little hint. This is from the same chapter of the same book uh, that the last one was from. Okay? So, and God blank. Let there be light. Light. Answer that for me in one, two, three. Said. Well done. And God said, let there be light. Interesting thing about that phrase, and God said. Uh, it, it's one of the phrases that sort of holds that first chapter of the first book of the Bible together. Nine times it says, and God said. And then it goes into a stanza. And God said. And God said. So here's what I love. I love how the stories of Scripture sort of weave together and work together. Centuries and centuries after that was written, after Jesus had walked this earth, one of his friends, a guy named John, decides to write a story about his friend Jesus. And he's thinking about how to begin this thing. And what he wants people to understand is that Jesus didn't just come onto the scene at Christmas. I mean, Jesus didn't just start existing when Mary had a baby. Jesus always has existed. And so John's thinking about that story at the beginning of Genesis, and he's thinking about, well, you know, when, when, when God said things, what came out of his mouth? Words. So he's thinking about words. And then the first thing that God created, and God said, let there be light. He's thinking about light. And he's thinking about darkness. And he weaves these things together into the opening of his story about Jesus. And so let's read together. John chapter 1. In the beginning, he starts it just like Genesis, <laughs> was the Word. Hmm. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, whoa, the Word is a person. Huh. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. That has been made in him was life. And that life was the what? The light, right? God said, and let there be light. Of all mankind, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, we call Jesus God's son, which is appropriate. The Bible does that too. But John, in this moment, to prove a point, calls Jesus God's word. John wants us to understand Jesus as the eternal part of God, what we would call one of the three persons of God, the Trinity, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this, this foundational Christian belief that, that God has existed and always had in, in three persons and John wants us to know that Jesus is one of those persons. We go on all day about the Trinity. It's hard. I'll, I'll just say that. It's supposed to be. We're talking about God. It's hard to get our minds around that. But, but here's the thing I want you to catch. John does this so that we understand that Jesus has always existed. Jesus, when the, when the mountains were formed and the oceans were gathered together, Jesus was there as creator, as maker of all. Jesus is maker. And he's maker, as John tells us, of all things. And that includes you. You might even think especially 
you. I mean, when we look back at that Genesis story, uh, the author kind of really wanted to make that obvious. Think about how kind of it went. I'll explain it to you if you haven't heard it before. The first few verses when God is creating, God is, is saying things as we've talked about. And that God's word, uh, oceans and land are formed. We have, have light in the sky. And then he dots the sky with stars and with a moon and sun. And then at God's word, uh, lions start roaming the ground, Right? Trees spring up, birds fly through the air, and God is doing all of this with voice, with word. But then it comes time to make us. <laughs> and we're told in the scriptures that instead of God clearing the throat, God rolls up the sleeves. That's not what it says in the scriptures, but it could have. Because it says that God swept hands through the earth and gathered the dust and fashioned and molded into humanity. And as if that is not enough to indicate how special we are to our maker, it says that God then presses lips to that mound of mud and breathes into our nostrils the breath of life. How special indeed you are to your maker. Understanding Jesus as maker tells us something of our value, but it also tells us something of our purpose as well. I want to steal from some of the words of the great missionary Paul when he was writing to some churches. He wrote this in Colossians chapter 1. In him, speaking of Jesus... All things were created, things in heaven and things on earth. And that's kind of a basic idea we've already gone over, right? In Jesus, you have stars and sun and lions and, and gorillas and trees and birds. In him, all the things came to being. But then Paul says, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. Are you catching this? It's not just the things created by Jesus and for Jesus. It's also the stuff that influences the things. The things that has authority over the things. The stuff that controls or dictates or moves or motivates the things. All of that stuff originally by and for Jesus. All of it still supposed to be by and for Jesus. So when John says all things are made through Jesus, and when Paul writes that all things are made by and for Jesus, he's talking about everything and the things that influence the things, and that includes you. And the things that influence you, and catch this, the things that you influence put it into basic ideas, that parent supposed to parent for Jesus. That doctor's supposed to practice for Jesus. Your boss is supposed to lead for Jesus. All things were made by him, through him, by him, and for him. We live in a world where we can be influenced by many, many things. We can be driven by worry, anxiety. We can be driven by money and prestige and pride, maybe even popularity or achievement. There are so many things that can drive us. But understand that when you meet your maker, you also meet your mission. When you discover your maker, you also discover your motivation. All things created by and for Jesus, and not just the things, but also the things that influence the things. By and for Jesus. So in summarizing this idea, or this first fundamental I want you to understand about Jesus, we need to understand that Jesus is an eternal part of God. We are immeasurably valuable to our maker, and we derive our purpose in life from our maker. Understanding Jesus as maker is huge, but it's still incomplete in terms of the picture we have to have. So let's go on. John chapter 1, again, he's writing this story about Jesus, and it's a cool story. 
the true light that gives light to everyone. So, so at first, John spoke of Jesus as a word. Now he's speaking of Jesus as a light. Was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. He made the world, but the world didn't get it. <laughs> didn't hear it. Do you remember being a kid, and when your parents would suggest something to you, you'd be like, lame. <laughs> Like, no, whatever. <laughs> and then, like, if one of your friends suggested the exact same thing, you'd be like, yes, awesome idea, right? I can remember one time when I was, um, I was younger. I was, it was like a weekend, maybe a holiday, and I was laying around the house thinking I had nothing to do because you can't think of anything when you're like a teenager. Um, and so my mom was like, hey, you should, you know, call some friends over, build a fire, make some s'mores. I think it'd be a good time. And I was like, mom, boys don't eat s'mores lame. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I broke down and I did it. I broke down and had some guys over and we were sitting around and, and then we were all sitting around acting like we had nothing to do. And so I was like, oh, what do I got? Well, this is all I got. So, hey, hey guys, we could, you know, like make a fire. And they were like, fire? Yes! And then I was like, well, you got some marshmallows. Marshmallows? We love marshmallows. And I was like, we got some we could do some s'mores. S'mores! Oh my goodness, yes, awesome. So we went running out the house, fire, s'mores. You know, and my mom, I'm sure, is like, a little credit, you know? No. It's just funny how we have a hard time hearing it from certain people. People, this is the story of the maker and the maker's creation. <laughs> There was just something between us, like we couldn't hear it from our maker. Our maker had a will and a way and a life for us to understand, but man, we just couldn't get it. Because here's the thing, even though all things were made by Jesus, we haven't always been for Jesus, or at least I haven't, okay? I know that, I know that as a parent, I probably haven't always parented in a way that honors my maker. I know that as a worker, I probably haven't always done business in a way that honors my maker. As a friend, I probably haven't always treated people in a way that honors my maker and my purpose. Even though I was made by Jesus, I, I confess I haven't always been for Jesus. But our maker wasn't about to let that stand in the way. Our maker knew something. Our maker knew, you know what? They might not hear it from me, but maybe they'd hear it from one of their friends. <laughs> maybe they would hear it from one of their friends. So John writes it this way in John chapter 1. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, the word that spoke the stars and the lions and all that stuff into creation wrapped himself in flesh and blood and walked our streets and played our games and sat at our tables and ate our food and lived among us. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Because even though we have been made by Jesus, we haven't always been for Jesus. So our Maker stepped into this world to be our. Savior. That's the second fundamental understanding we have to grasp about Jesus. Is Jesus is not only our maker, but Jesus is also our Savior. And the way that he became our Savior is really interesting. And John says it right there. I need you to, I need you to understand this, and I need you to take this home with you. So I'm going to do something kind of funny here. It says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. So I need you to grasp those things. I'm going to do something silly here, but you're going to remember it for later, okay? I got a little grace right here. Get your hands up. I'm going to throw it to you. I need you to catch it and put it away somewhere safe. Here it comes. Catch it. 
all right? Some of it, it hit you right in the face. You didn't catch it. <laughs> Put it away. Put your grace away. Some of you, here's truth right over here. Catch it. Grab, good catch. That was one-handed. Well done. Stick it away. Grace and truth. We have to understand that. Before I get to those, listen. Jesus had to come to us as Savior. And most of us are humble enough to admit that we need a Savior. Most of us are humble enough to admit that we've contributed to some of that division. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, Ethan has reminded us in such a wonderful way that this creation that our Maker made is beautiful, but it is also broken. And most of us are humble enough to admit that maybe we've contributed to that brokenness. It's a hard illustration to, to, to give to you, but it's maybe the best that I've got to try to understand how serious this truth is, that there is a brokenness. There is a division between us and God. So here's what I got. Some of us, and probably some of us in this room, have felt the pain when there is division between a parent and child. Maybe you've been the child, and there's been division between you and your parent. Maybe you've been a parent, and there's been division between you and, you and your child. i got to confess, uh, with three kids, one of my greatest mortal fears is that I'm going to do something that drives a wedge, that creates a division between my, me and my child. It hurts me to even think about it. I'm, I can't even begin to understand maybe some of the pain that you all have felt if you've experienced that. And it's hard as that pain is. What we need to understand is there is an even more serious division in our lives that can take place. The division between a parent and child could last a lifetime, but people, the division between you and your maker who loved you and fashioned you can be an eternal division. But God wouldn't stand for it. So our maker came into this world to be our savior. And he did it with those things that I threw back at you. So pull those out. What did Jesus come full of? He came full of grace and grace and truth. First for Jesus, it was the truth. We might call it teaching. We might call it wisdom. We might call it how to live this life. But Jesus walked among his disciples and they sat at his feet and he taught them. He taught them things about pride and about anger and about humility, about relationships, about faithfulness. He said all of these things to his disciples. He gave them truth, a way, a life. And then he modeled it for them. He walked it before them and lived what is said to be a perfect life without the separation from God, without the division from God, without the blemish, without the brokenness, without what we call sin. And then to heal our relationship, he gave that life up. He said that brokenness that devastation, I will take it upon myself because I don't want you to have to have it. Again, I'm borrowing from the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Again, people, it is a painful thing that we have to look at what our Savior did for us, but we need to. Whether you want to close your eyes or whatever you want to do, I want you to picture the scene at the cross. Picture the ugliness of it. Picture the pain of it. Picture the brokenness of it. And what we have to understand is when we don't honor the truth given to us by our maker, the way and the life, this is where it goes. The ugliness and the pain and the devastation of the cross. This is where lying, cheating, pride, gossip, murder, unable to forgive, un unwilling to forget. It's where it all goes. It goes to this brokenness. It goes to this devastation and this ugliness. And what you've got to understand is it leads to devastation in this life, but also separation from God in the next. 
that's where sin goes. And that's what Jesus took on for us. He took on all of the devastation and the hurt and the pain. And in doing so, he offers us a gift. And that's what we call the grace, the healing, the forgiveness, the mercy. So to sum up what our Savior has done for us, our Savior taught us to show us truth from our Maker, and our Savior died to give us the grace of a Savior, to make us the beautiful even if broken, the broken yet still beloved of God. What a tremendous thing it is that our maker became also our savior, but it's incomplete without this last fundamental that I want to give you today, that Jesus is not only our maker and our savior, but Jesus is also our ruler. He died to restore that relationship, to take on all that pain, even some of the pain that we have contributed to. He died to take it on himself and say, I don't want you to experience it. I will experience it. That's what I'm doing on the cross. I'm taking that pain, but he didn't stay on the cross. <laughs> he rose again from that cross, from that grave, and he rose to destroy not us, but that which has deceived us. The word, the word with this tremendous power to speak stars and gorillas and lions into their place. The, the one who, who crafted the seas and also calmed the seas. The one who spoke the lions into Rome and the land, but also raised up his friend Lazarus from the dead. That one has said, I will not use my power to destroy you, but to take on the pain and destroy that which has deceived you. That's what I will destroy. In the cross, as our Savior, Jesus says, we're good. Me and you, we're good. I know there's been some painful stuff. I'm not going to take it out on you. I will just take it. We're good. And as ruler, he says, now, can you hold my things? Because I'm going to rise and kick Satan's tail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hallelujah. He used his power not to destroy us, but to destroy that which has deceived us. And that is what the resurrection is. It's a glimpse of the power of our ruler. Listen to Paul once again. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam, the first human, all will die. But in Christ, all will be made alive each in turn. Christ, the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father, and he has destroyed all what? Dominion and power and authority. Not just the things are going to be under Jesus, but all the things that influence the things are all going to be under Jesus. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last thing that's going to die is death. Res the resurrection of Jesus is a first fruit. It's a glimpse of the restorative power he has over creation and all that is in us, a restorative power that our ruler will display when he comes and makes all things right. And the scriptures give us such beautiful pictures of what that rule of Jesus is like. Lions laying with lambs. <laughs> Those who have been beaten down raised up. Tears wiped dry. Mourning turned to dancing. Beauty from ashes. Justice rolling like a river and the healing of all nations. The brokenness of every tongue, tribe, and place united together and healed in rejoicing all things broken, made holy, beautiful again. And by all things, that includes you. And we don't have to wait for that time to give our lives to our good ruler. We can walk with that ruler now. That restoring power can come into your life now. We look to his way and just say, I know my ruler. My ruler lives and reigns with humility. Am I humble? My ruler reigns with honesty. He talked about that, letting your yes be yes and your no be no. 
Am I honest? My ruler is generous with grace. Am I? We know the story. We know his rule. We can live under it now. All three of these things, Jesus as our maker and our savior and our ruler, they are so fundamental to helping us follow who Jesus is and recognize him. I want to end today with just an uh, illustration from uh, a common item, a three-legged stool. <laughs> a three-legged stool. When you look at a three-legged stool, every single one of those legs is necessary, right? I mean, you have a four-legged stool, you could lose one of the legs and you could rearrange the three to still sit on the thing. But if you have a three-legged stool and you lose one of those legs, it's really hard to make a stool out of two legs, right? I know some of you engineers are processing and figuring it out, but just bear with me, okay? All three are necessary, like offense, defense, and special teams. <laughs> we need to know Jesus as maker, savior, and ruler. Because here's the thing, you can know Jesus as maker, and that'll feel really good. You will know how special you are to your maker. You will know your purpose. You will know that you are loved by your maker. But you may forget how much the maker loves everybody else too. You may, you, may, you may forget your need for grace, your need for a savior. And so we gotta have Jesus as savior as well. And savior is wonderful, but, but it's incomplete. Because all if all we have is savior, we'll remember that we contributed to the brokenness of this world. We, we will remember that we have done things, painful things, brokenness, devastation, that led Jesus to that cross. But if we stay in that place, our faith can be characterized by guilt and shame. And Jesus did not die to make you guilty and shameful. Jesus died to rise. Jesus died to remove that barrier and that division so that you could give your life to your maker. Our maker formed us from the dust of the earth and breathe it into us the breath of life. Our maker loves us. And even though all things are made by and for Jesus, I haven't always been for Jesus. And so our maker came to be savior, teaching us wisdom, way, truth, and life, and saving us, healing the division with grace. And we can give our lives to him as ruler, the good, and wise, restoring ruler who rose from the dead and will come again to restore all things. We get to share in the Lord's Supper every week, but today it feels especially right, you know, as we spent some time thinking about Jesus. If you've got your communion elements, go ahead and grab them. If you didn't, that's okay. You can grab some from the back if you're worshiping with us online. Uh, now it's time to grab the crackers and the juice or whatever you have. During this time that we experience each week, we pull out that bread representing the body that was broken. We sip that juice representing the blood that was spilt. We remember the moment that our Savior made a way for us back to our Maker who fashioned us and loves us. We remember the moment of the cross when our Savior took on the powers of this world that deceived us and became ruler of all. And that all three of those things, maker, savior, and ruler, are summed up in one name, and that name is the name of Jesus. Let's remember him now. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this moment that we have to remember your deep love to remember how you have taught us and how you have saved us. And to remember that you are Lord over all creation, Lord over life and death. You've displayed it once and you will again in your coming. We remember your power and your love now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.